Hi, I'm Kate Fulb. I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, part of the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism's Norman Lear Center. Hollywood Health and Society is a free resource for TV and screenwriters to get accurate information and access to experts on anything to do with health and medicine, science, safety, and security. We have partnered with the Writers Guild and the Producers Guild and a number of other television and screen organizations uh, to bring this webinar series to you during the age of COVID-19. Um, we are available to provide you with access to experts like the ones you're gonna hear from tonight, as well as information on a wide variety of topics on health and science and safety uh, to ensure that your scripts are as accurate and compelling as possible. We are working during this uh, quarantine time and are happy to take your calls and requests. You can visit our website to find out how to reach us at Hollywood Health and Society. Org. Um, tonight's panel discussion, Racism and Maternal Health in the Age of COVID-19, has, has had a very popular response, so we're very excited. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to tonight's moderator, uh, Prisca Neely, who is from Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and has been covering these issues for many, many years, and we're delighted to have Priska with us um, to moderate tonight's discussion. Welcome, Priska, and enjoy the discussion. Thank you, thanks so much, Kate, and it's an honor to be here, um, and I'm really happy to know that there was such a high demand for this um, that we had to kind of move it over to Facebook. There'll be a live stream there, and this will be recorded, and it'll be up on the website in a couple days. Um, before I introduce our esteemed panel, I just want to take a second to kind of acknowledge the day and what we're going to be talking about. Um, some heavy stuff. Racism in birthing during a pandemic. And um, I know that I was watching the George Floyd funeral earlier today, and there's just a lot going on right now. So I want to, if you know you're out there watching, I like to do this sometimes before starting discussions on this topic. Let's all just take a deep breath. Okay. So our panelists, first we have Dr. Joya Creer Perry. She's the founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. We have Monica McLemore. She's a clinician and a scientist. She's Associate Professor of Family Healthcare Nursing at UC San Francisco. And Dr. Emily Dossett, a reproductive psychiatrist and director of the Women's Health and Reproductive Psychiatry for LA County Department of Mental Health. Thank you all so much for being here. Now, since we have a primary audience of storytellers, I was thinking that it would be great if we could all start off by kind of talking about how we got into doing this work. And I'll, I'll start with myself. I've been telling stories about primarily black moms and babies and the challenges that they face in this country in birthing for about three years now. And it started when I started hearing the statistics and realized this is something that had impacted my own family, my own sisters, and that they didn't even know that they were wrapped up in this larger statistic. And that's really what's driven a lot of the stories that I've continued to report over the years because of the eerie similarities that um, the stories of my own family have with so many women across the country. Um, and so now I want to throw that that question to our panelists. And let's start with, uh, with you, Dr. Creer Perry. Um, you, you know, founded the National Birth Equity Collaborative. How did you get into this work of birth equity? Thank you so much. And Priska, it's such an awesome opportunity to see your face. <laughs> yes, we've only, we've only talked to the okay, I know. Good to see your face. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, I am the mother of three children. Um, my first child was born when I was in medical school and um, she was born full term but I was delivered her in a, in a delivery room where only the, my then husband was allowed to come into the room and so my mother was peeking through the window outside it was an operating room type place and I was it was a normal vaginal delivery I had no illnesses 
Um, but the rule was only one person could come in the room and they, I, she was born in an operating room type atmosphere. And I can remember thinking that my mother, who at the time I was only 21 years old, so I might as well have been 12 to her, right? I left Princeton and come home. And um, for her, that feeling of my baby is in there alone without me. And she kept jumping, trying to see me. Um, and so I, that feeling of disconnectedness and how healthcare is opposite, it treats us differently from what people's expectations or desires are, is deeply inside of uh, the work that I do. And it comes from a personal space, um, knowing that nothing about science has ever been without personal stories. Everybody brings their personal identity to science and this idea that it's neutral and doesn't come from your um, lived experience has never been a truth. So that's my story. My origin story. Muted myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Monica McLemore, how, how about you? I know we've, we've talked about this before, how you got into this work. Well, it's good to see your face too. And, and we've actually met in person. So I'm mm -hmm. actually really glad to see everybody on this webinar. I use she and her pronouns. Um, and I think it's really important to say that. Mm -hmm. So for people who, who know me and who've heard me talk about my life, I like to remind folks, this is Disneyland Paris in my background. I spent my 50th birthday there um, on, on New Year's Eve. And so that means I was born, you know, New Year's Eve of 1969. Mm -hmm. But quietly, I, my birthday should have been Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. I was a preemie. Mm -hmm. And so all the work I do is personal. I have an older sister who was full term. I have a younger brother who was full term. Mm -hmm. And somehow I was born eight weeks early as a preemie a year after the Civil Rights Act was signed, um, where there had been a huge transition between my family. My father had gone to Penn. You talk about Princeton, uh, mm -hmm. Joya. Dad gone to Penn, graduated law school. You know, he was already a lawyer and I was a preemie. Mm -hmm. And so all the work I do is personal. Mm -hmm. um, it has to do with my own lived experience, the lived experience of my sisters, you know, my mom. I learned out as, as an adult, my mom had a a uh, fetal demise in between me and my sister. That's why there's such an age disparity. But I didn't learn that until I had already been a nurse for like a decade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the stories that we tell um, and the stories that we know, it, it's all personal. The science that I do, it has to do with improving outcomes and wanting to make the future better. Um, Dr. Dossett, how, how did you come to do what you do? Sure. So thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Um, my pronouns are also she, her, and hers. And the only reason they're not on the label is I'm a complete Luddite and have no idea how to actually change the label for my name. Um, how did I come to do what I do? So I went into medical school um, wanting to be a cancer doctor. I wanted to be an oncologist. And then as time went on and I spent time with patients, I realized that the part of oncology that actually drew me was the emotional part and the sitting with patients and hearing their stories and that no matter how sick they were, at the end of the day, it really seemed to be their emotional and mental health that kind of won out in terms of importance to them and to their families. And I ended up going into psychiatry. So then when I was in my training, my residency training, <clears throat> I was pregnant with my own first child and I was at UCLA that happened to have a specialty clinic and women's mental health, which always makes me laugh because we are over 50% of the population, yet we're still a specialty, right? But in that clinic, I learned how to manage women who had um, pretty serious mental illness, like to the point that they need medication management, which is an MD is what I do. And I was absolutely amazed at the lack of care and knowledge in the medical profession overall on how to help these women. I mean, they were routinely told, oh, you're pregnant and you're fill in the blank, bipolar, severely depressed, anxious. You know what? You'll feel good in pregnancy. There are these happy hormones that kick in. So come back and see me in nine months. And guess what? That's not true. And so women would fall apart. They would, their families would suffer, their babies would suffer. And I decided I wanted to specialize in what's called reproductive psychiatry, which is helping women through times of reproductive change where psychiatrically they may struggle. And really since I've graduated, um, my focus has been increasingly on working in the public sector. I take a lot of pride in working in the public sector. Um, I, my clinical work right now is both in an OBGYN clinic in East Los Angeles, as well as in a clinic in South LA for women who are recently released out of jail. Um, and the inequities in both of those populations are profound. So um, that is how I came to this work. And so the marginalized folks 
in my day-to-day -day tend to be the mentally ill. And unfortunately, because they're in the public sector, the vast majority are folks who are black and brown. Thank you so much for that. I love asking that question just because it's so illuminating and just in your answers, you touched on so many of the issues that we're gonna dive into deeper now. Um, so we're kind of talking, we're talking about these issues through the lens of this pandemic and COVID-19. But I think, you know, as a journalist, something that I've just been thinking about over and over and how I frame my stories is that so many of the issues that are the, so many of the gaps that are growing wider during this pandemic were already there. These are pre-existing conditions that are only getting worse. So I wanna take a step back and just talk about the state of black maternal health um, before, before the pandemic. So um, Dr. Kerry Perry, I'd like to, to start with you, kind of what, what should we know about the state of maternal health in the United States and black maternal health specifically? Thank you. So we know that the black um, maternal health in general in the United States, um, we are the only industrialized nation where birth, women are dying in childbirth at increasing rates. Um, every other country that has as much money and as much power as we do, they have figured out a way to decrease each year the number of women who die within a year of childbirth. But we have not managed to do that. We have not put the political will behind doing that. Um, so we, and then in addition to that, black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth and native women as well are three times as likely to die in childbirth as their white counterparts or white peers. And so that was pre-COVID. We already had this as a foundation. We knew that the intersection of both racism or the belief of a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color or the devaluation of people based upon what they look like was impacting their health outcomes. And we also knew that gender, the belief that women can only serve certain roles and should be told what to do and not listen to and that they don't have personal control over their bodies and should be relegated to certain positions, that that also impacts our health. So that already pre-existed any the pandemic um, and we have really been fighting for the last five years to bring visibility to that conversation. In fact, this, this same platform allowed for that conversation with Dr. McLemore and some of my colleagues like Dr. Karen Scott. And so I want to dissect, um, you know, this statistic that is, you know, it's becoming a little bit more well known, um, but that a, you know, a black mom is three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy related comp complications than a white woman. And that's something that, you know, in the past may maybe three or four years is starting to become more of a known thing. But I want to dissect that a little bit and talk about what exactly is going on there. Um, Monica, can you, can you kind of dig into that? Yeah, I want to, you know, riff off of a little bit of what Joy has said and, and, and Dr. Career Perry, please, you know, back me up. Um, but, you know, Billy Avery said on a national webinar earlier this week, and for people who don't know her, she's one of the like, founding mothers of, of reproductive health and a MacArthur Genius Award winner and just as amazing person. She said that we're in the midst of a very novel pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and a very old one, racism. And I, I had to like sort of pause when she said that because, you know, I, I, it made some things click for me that, that we've known all along. So first of all, let's talk about the three to four times more likely to die because I think for storytellers, it's super important for you to understand that for years, um, our federal government that's responsible for collecting statistics and data um, has been woefully underfunded. And so the reason that within the last three or four years, that we've gotten a lot more attention from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And yes, it's the same CDC we're hearing about around COVID-19. People forget that their job is as a surveillance organization and a policy organization to really help us to be able to plan public health and disseminate resources. Um, they weren't collecting pregnancy-related statistics uh, until very, very recently. And the data that, that we did have actually were, were not consistent with, with international guidelines. So again, this, this war around the WHO and the CDC, the World Health Organization and, and other, this isn't new. And so we didn't have good data. I would argue that we still don't um, because for the storytellers, I, I will just say that historically how we count deaths in pregnancy, there, I know this is gonna sound very strange to people, but there is no consistent way to do it. Right? So in some places, if you happen to be pregnant and you're in a car accident and you die in that car accident and you happen to be pregnant at that time, in some places that's counted as a pregnancy-related death, even though your death had nothing to do with your pregnancy. 
right? Because you died while you were pregnant. So as we, so part of this discussion really is sort of teasing out this whole notion that until, you know, three or four years ago, we actually didn't have a restoring, and Joya can correct me because I think she knows the dates way better than mm -hmm. I do, but we didn't have statistics that were being collected appropriately from our institutions or statistics were not being reported to the CDC. Actually, I should be more specific in my language because they, they actually don't do their own data collection. They rely on public health departments to report statistics to them. Um, we didn't have the data, so we didn't know. In the same way when you think about preterm birth or when you think about incarcerated people as, as Dr. Doss talked about, I've, I've done some work with them as well. We don't have good statistics on people with the capacity for pregnancy. When we do look at, at the statistics that we actually have, what we see then is when you think about, you know, white women and other women of color, black, Latinx, indigenous, you notice that more black, Latinx, indigenous people with the capacity for pregnancy die from what we think are preventable complications. And we do think about 60% of these are preventable um, when compared to the white counterparts. Do, uh, do you mind, Priscilla, if I respond, is that okay? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. And, and okay. I, I just, just because I, just a couple of two things um, yeah. in the storytelling space. Mm -hmm. Part of this is in the 1950s, the U.S. government said we'd fix maternal mortality. They mm. declared that we were the best in the world. Um, our rate was 100 per 100,000 and we were better than anybody else. And you know how we do. We fix something and we moved on. Um, and then we gradually stopped counting. We gradually defunded over the last 20 years all of our infrastructure for public health. So that's why it's really important to think about this in this COVID moment, because all the things that I, we have been saying for black maternal health for the last five years are the same things that we're having now. We don't collect the data. We're not following up on the data. We don't have enough people to check to see what's happening, what's going on. All of that is a devaluation and a defunding of the infrastructure for public health and us deciding that we were done. So it was really a kind of what the question is for storytellers is who is the public? Right, because if we agree that everyone is the public, then how we then care for the public changes. How we care for people who are homeless changes. How we care for people who are incarcerated changes. So the value of public health means you're supposed to care for all of the public. We have a great system if you can afford it, but public health, ensuring that everybody has the ability to thrive, a right to health. We haven't agreed upon that as a nation. Yeah. And in breaking down these statistics a little bit further, I think that when people hear this, oh, you know, black moms more likely to die, there are a lot of assumptions that come to mind. There are a lot of things that you may assume, oh, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. Um, but, you know, one thing that we know is that, it, you know, this is something that we see regardless of income, education. And I think that's a really important thing to, to get into. And I want to talk a little bit more about the racism piece in a second. But um, Dr. Dossett, I wanted to just know, you know, in the in with the populations that you work with, who may be, you know, a bit more mar marginalized, what, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, the challenges they're facing? It's, um, there's so many i'm like trying to think of even how to start um i would say that one of the biggest issues at least here in los angeles with the with the people that i work with is the issue of homelessness i mean it's been an issue here as in many parts of the country for a very long time um, we have had a dramatic surge upwards in homelessness um, and it very much plays into the racism conversation because Roughly 9% of Los Angeles County is African American, but about 30% of the homeless folks here are African American. So clearly there's a disparity there. And when COVID hit, the concern was that, you know, if someone in an encampment got infected, someone in a crowded shelter got infected, um, that the virus would just spread like wildfire. And most people who have been homeless for any period of time are probably gonna be in poor health um, because of exposure to the elements, maybe their substance use or smoking that's on board, maybe you know, there are other things that are gonna compromise their ability to you know, recover from COVID. So a big issue that we've been facing here in Los Angeles is how do we, how do we get folks simply in a place where they can wash their hands, right? How do we get them in a place where they can um, you know, wash the food that they eat, where they can have three meals a day when typically maybe they would go to a restaurant and maybe get food there 
that someone was giving to them, that's closed down. I mean, it's just been a tremendous issue. And a lot of the mental health issues have been exacerbated on top of it because of the stress and the fear and the anxiety. Um, so in thanks to like a lot of collaborative work throughout LA County and some funding from FEMA and different places, we were able to open up 23 different shelters across the city. We were able to open quarantine shelters and trailers for folks who were experiencing homelessness and tested positive for COVID. But you know, in this county that has 60,000 homeless people, that's barely scratching the surface. So one of the biggest challenges has been how do you decide who goes where, right? And then for someone who's used to living on the streets and is afraid that they're gonna be traumatized or beat up or whatever in a congregate shelter, particularly women, who many of them have histories of abuse or victimization, how do you even get them to want to go, right? And to stay in one place. So there's been a lot of issues around COVID. And then to be really honest, some of the folks I work with, I, I just one story, a young woman I work with in a shelter has been using drugs for quite a while and had kind of fallen off my clinic's radar screen and we located her in a shelter and I asked her how she felt about COVID. And she said, you know what? I've dealt with a lot worse stuff in my life. She said, I've seen some scarier viruses than this. And I was like, wow. she probably has, you know, she probably has. So a lot of it is about where you're coming from and what that his that trauma history is too. Yeah. And in terms well, of Can yeah. I piggyback on that just for a minute? Because you know, here in San Francisco, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to think about in terms of pe people who experience homelessness is the fact that going back to linking, you know, what Dr. Dawson has said and what Dr. Kerr Perry said, you know, if we had thought in, in a public health ethics perspective, we would have realized that, and I, I say this as a nurse who had full opportunity to take advantage of the uh, negotiated free hotel rooms for us to be able to shelter in place away from our families. If we had had a public health approach, that wouldn't have been discipline specific it wouldn't have been just because of my occupational exposure that I as a nurse could get a free hotel room, but the people who deliver my groceries didn't have that same opportunity. So again, when we come back to thinking about what does it mean, and, and, and I worry that you know we may have missed a prime opportunity and a window to tell that story. And so therefore for the storytellers, I really hope that we can think about reimagining what a public health response would look like in the context of realizing that, you know, differentials and exposure, irrespective of whether or not, you know, you come from a noble profession like I do in nursing versus whether or not you were homeless, that should have been irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? That's, in my opinion, that should have been irrelevant. We should, it, that gave us a, a prime opportunity to say that people with the capacity for pregnancy should be protected in the same way we have an opportunity to do that now with the decarceration of incarcerated individuals, but we still won't act to do that either well and i'll just to piggyback on what you just said too you know when i was talking about moving folks into some of these shelters the list of medical conditions that fema gave us for folks that they would fund did not include pregnant women of course not because we're never included in disaster preparedness right we had we had to advocate and get a local waiver that our county would pay for women who were pregnant which by definition is an immune compromised state right and even then, we could only house pregnant women who had an additional medical condition on top of it, such as gestational diabetes or asthma or whatnot. To which I told my staff, they all have something, just find it, right? Wow. Everybody. <laughs> Well, when, when we talk about homelessness, people experiencing homelessness too, I mean, having been a reporter in LA before, I think, you know, we talk about kind of stereotypes and myth busting, um, and especially family homelessness. I did a big project on that. You know, so many families are on the cusp of homelessness, you know, right. there's, right. it could, it could happen. So many people are so close to slipping. Right in there because of housing costs and all that. Well, and the other issue is that women with children were not allowed to move into hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. There could be no minors. So I raised the question, what happens when a pregnant woman delivers the baby? Can she go back to her hotel room? Wow. And everyone was like, hmm, I don't know. That's a good question. And I actually never got a straight answer for it. So you know, again, just do it. Just go back and take care of that baby and we'll cross that bridge later, right? But 
this just shows again how women's health and the health of people who are able to have a baby is often put to the side, even though by any public health measure, it's the, those are the people we should be paying the most attention to right. for the good of our country and our society. So I just want to remind our listeners that you can, um, su you can submit questions through the Q&A function, and we'll be getting to those um, in, a, in about a half an hour. We'll, we'll take some questions. Um, so much that we could talk about here, but um, in getting back to kind of the, you know, these statistics in this space and what they were before, so we talked about kind of the pre-existing issues, talked a little bit about what is getting worse right now. But when we talk about, um, when we talk about this issue, a lot of times, you know, Dr. Creer Perry, something that you and I have talked about before is this concept that, you know, it's not race, it's racism it's you know, racism, it's not race. Right. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that when we see these disparities in birth outcomes? Mm -hmm. What role does racism play? So this is where the storytellers in the audience are really important for us because this narrative around how we talk about medical illnesses um, and risk factors um, is really important. So the general public, for example, you think of a risk factor for lung cancer. Everybody knows because of media and people who've written stories and articles that smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer. So what we do is then we do things like tax the tobacco industry, we regulate the tobacco industry, we say smoking, and even though they denied it and they lied about it for a long time and people said it wasn't a real thing, we still fought and we had to really build power through storytelling to beat that and to be able to now, now if you were to tell somebody that smoking is not linked to lung cancer, they would think you thought the earth was flat. It's just a common thing that everybody believes. We know it to be true. Okay, so currently, if you look at the risk factors for preterm birth, if you look at the risk factors for maternal mortality, it would say black. So I'm sitting here black as day, gonna be black till I die. I got afro, black skin, all those things. I also have some Irish genes, right? My daughter did the 23andMe thing, so I found out I got all kind of other stuff. So I don't know what part of my blackness, my African ancestry makes me magically have worse birth outcomes. And, but that's the way science has written this because it's based upon this belief, starting back from Darwin, who was gonna replace the, the title of his book included, the replacement of the better race, right? We we're gonna, at this point, we should all now all have a whole world, including Latinx people be all gone and the world will be full, filled with people of European descent. So this idea that it's blackness as the risk factor causes us to do things to do against black for black people instead of fixing racism. So it's not the blackness of my skin that caused me to have a baby early, but it's the racism that's impacting my body. So when we change that risk factor, when we say in the list, instead of putting black, if we put racism, then we can actually actively act upon that because we can actually do things about racism. We can do accountability, we can do teaching, we can change the racist textbooks that we have that say things like we have different lung capacity. We still teach that. We have different kidney capacity. We still teach that. It makes no biological sense that my lungs would be different than Dr. Dossett's lungs. That makes no sense. But yet we still have that in all of our books and we do that in all of our tests. So those are, that's why it's so important for all of us to stop saying that being black is a risk factor because racism is. Yeah. And I want to take that to the next level so there are, you know there are these things that come along with a lot of it is is the experience of being a black woman in the united states what um you know when you heard about this pandemic what was on your mind um monica i'll, I'll throw this to you kind of what was on your mind about the experience of getting giving birth and like what could be complicated during this pandemic what were you worried about and what are well, you seeing? What, what stories do you have? Well, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember H1N1, SARS, swine flu, uh, uh, HIV, MERS, right? I, I, I started nursing in 1988. And so for me, you know, having seen uh, epidemics and pandemics, um, it's very interesting to know that, you know, as Dr. Dossa correctly pointed out, pregnant people by definition are immunocompromised or have a, have a different immune function, let me say it that way, because they're, they're just sitting and growing, you know, foreign DNA from another person, right? So, you know, as you think about the fact that during most uh, pandemics and epidemics that have been uh, of an infectious disease kind of situation, 
um, that we've seen a trajectory where there has been poorer outcomes for people with the capacity for pregnancy. So the first thing I thought to myself was, wow, is this SARS, MERS, H1N1, swine flu, HIV? Like we're going to see a situation where pregnant people are going to have a particular vulnerability. We were already in a black maternal health crisis. So let's clear that up. I mean, in fact, the day before we all went to national shelter in place, the momnibus had been introduced for a reason, nine bills in the Congress by partisan support by 100 people to actually address what was already then an existing black maternal health crisis, right? So you layer on top of that a viral infectious disease, a new virus. And the first thing I thought in the back of my mind was, oh boy, pregnant people are really not gonna fare well here. Oh boy, black people are really not gonna fare here well here. Because in the reproductive health rights and justice space, we already knew that there were still battles, and I will say this to the writers as well, we're still waiting for two Supreme Court rulings this week, like this or this month, any day. One is about contraception, one's about abortion. We don't fund reproductive health rights and justice. And so to already not be collecting good data, to already have a new viral infectious agent, to already have a particularly physiologically vulnerable population of individuals. I thought, God, this is a recipe for disaster. And to also then appreciate the public health piece of, wow, Black people are going to be overrepresented in essential workers. And wow, you know, we don't have the healthcare workforce that we need. That's something that Joy didn't mention, but I'd like to point out, you know, one of the things we could make really different decisions about how we deploy our healthcare services. One of the reasons I was one of the first people to come out publicly around the restrictions of birthing folks in New York City was because I was really, really worried that that individual ethics don't work in the context of public health ethics, especially when you're starting to think about rational things. We hadn't already made the decision that people could work across state lines. Healthcare workers have always had national licensure. We should have been able to deploy resources to New York sooner than we did, right? Or like with us, our institution sending people to Navajo Nation, there's an incredible story, right? You talk about people in LA who can't wash their hands. Let's think about being on a reservation where there's no running water. So, I, I mean, there's so many stories. There were so many things that went through my mind. And, and the, the one top of mind was pregnant people are gonna fare poorly in this pandemic because they're already not doing well. Yeah, and in terms of the, the supports, um, you know, around birthing, we hear a lot about about doulas and midwives, and some states are taking and, and counties are taking more steps to, you know, get insurance to cover that sort of thing. But I'm wondering, you know, during during the pandemic, um, you know, are those birth workers able to to provide that support? Yeah, you know, I mean, even in New York City, it was so bad that they weren't even allowing partners into the room for a while. So birthing people were having babies alone. Um, and that goes back to that original conversation when we decided that birthing was this medical event versus what we know it to be, which is a communal event. It's, a, it's not, um, I, my father's an ophthalmologist, so a cataract surgery is something you need to do in a hospital. It's very important. It's high risk. You know, it's a surgery. Having a baby is honestly something that we do to celebrate in community and that, that you can't enforce your cultural beliefs of how it should be only one person. We've now made that into a rule for all other people. And that actually decreases safety for communities of color because their cultural identity is in having, a, having other people, having it's a communal, it's, a, it's an event that we wanna share. So having this COVID moment, we were really nervous around how not just the physically taking away what we need in social connectedness, when you say, oh, you have to have a baby. I've only ever delivered a person by themselves alone, very rarely, very rarely. Most people have someone in the room. It is a very lonely, feeling to have a bit to, uh, this beautiful joyous moment and it's just you and a birthing person having a baby in the room and so to make that be a rule across cities across states and I truthfully understood that it meant that there was panic that's what it meant because I don't know any hospital administrator that would say on purpose out loud you can't even have your partner in the room that meant there was sheer chaos and panic and so that was never articulated to the public so all the public got is continued mistrust because it was, not an, it was not an articulation of, we would never say you can't have anybody unless there was something going on. And so that support went on with Tula. So we had to, the governor had to pass a law to make hospitals allow for support people to be able to be in the room. So we really need to rethink when we say safety in hospital systems and in healthcare, what does that mean? 
because for communities of color, it's always meant I need someone else with me. I don't feel safe in here by myself. I need you to have someone else with me. And so you need to include that in your calculations of risk assessments when you're creating your policies. Well, and I think this is something that's so important to bring up because looking into the future, right? Like I know here in Los Angeles, most hospitals, you're allowed like one support person, right? How long is it going to be that way? Like that's what worries me is that this could go on and on and on in sort of an indefinite way because the conversation isn't happening about how important it is for many people to have their support group there, you know? Um, yeah. Standards. I don't want it to become the new normal, the new standard. Exactly, and one of the most depressing things that, that we also should be writing about that, that no one I've seen sort of do any real criticality around is the, what it, how are we going to prioritize public health in the context of the recession that's gonna be triggered by the pandemic? You know, it broke my heart. I sat here in tears the day that they told me that the 14 county Medicaid doula pilot project that we have been working on for a year with many collaborators throughout the state was being pulled from the California state legislature because we were concerned, there were budgetary concerns around being able to have a Medicaid doula pilot, something that we've thought about and really, really skillfully heard from doulas around the state, you know, birth worker support to really see if we could improve maternal health outcomes that just, that just fell by the wayside because there is economic fear mm -hmm. about the pandemic spawning you know, a recession. Okay, so what are our health policy decisions going to be in the context of the recession that we think is going to be spawned by the pandemic? Right. Because that is the other piece that we're not having a conversation about. I too worry that this is, it, it, it's too easy to normalize nobody being with birthing people, especially for the places that were actually tepid around having doulas around anyway. Right. Um, I just think it's an excuse and, and we just should not allow it. A question from the audience, just to add into this, um, can you talk about that that decision to limit support people doulas in the delivery room? Like, do, how do you rate the risk there, the risk of exposure and that panic that you spoke to that wasn't really communicated um, versus the you know the benefits of having someone in the room? Like, how, what what's more high risk to, in your? Yeah, and I think the hard part is that we centralized birthing to be in these really fancy hospitals and we haven't built out an infrastructure for birthing centers we have people get all nervous about home birth even though all the other countries that have as much money as we do do it so it's like all we haven't created our risk assessment is based upon um a belief that ba people babies need, people need to have babies in the icu like i did that birthing needs to happen in the most intensive high risk of, of space. And so until we let go of that belief system, it's hard to have an honest conversation around what the risk assessment is because we've already overcalculated risk for birthing in the US in the first place. Like we've never, we all train, I trained, most people train in high risk environments. I trained at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. The people are very, very sick. They do have a lot of illnesses and they're black and brown. Across the United States, people are training in institutions that have a high volume of high risk patients. So we think still think like that when we're in private practice. We still remember the black woman who almost died, who had a heart attack. So we think everybody has to have this really super intensive care. And the truth is 99% of the births are perfectly normal. And we have never created a risk assessment for all of that. So when I look at some of the pushback, we've got it around risk assessment for family members and doulas coming in the hospitals, I challenge all of it because we've never had an accurate risk assessment about birthing in the first place. So we always go to, no, you can't do, no, you can't have, we can only have one person. And it's not new to have one person. As I mentioned, I did that. We've been doing that to black and brown people. They do it in New York City pre-COVID. Yeah. So this has been a normal thing to police the number of people that you can have in a room. And so, this, so what I'm hoping is for this moment to allow for empathy for all of us. So now you see what it feels like to be marginalized. Everybody's being told no. People are trying to go into birthing centers who never thought about it before. People who've never even cared about a home birth, now they're, they're buying up all the home births and paying for all the things because they have the money and the resource. So the level of empathy of saying, what would a new world look like if we allowed for freedom in birthing and the risk assessment, we valued the choices that birthing people make and the risk that they want to take for their bodies, for their patients. They have an autonomy. They, if they decide they want to do stuff, why don't we value what they want? This well, is also where I think... 
Let me, let me piggyback one more point onto that that I think is important for the writers here. You know, before COVID, you know, there was not enhanced billing or payment through the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services for telehealth services. We also have not built out home birth and birth center services as well. Most poor people and most people who probably could benefit from, you know, birthing centers and midwifery birth and home birth, they don't have an insurance and they don't have money to be able to pay out of pocket. Right? We had a window when we asked CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, to provide enhanced billing, not only for telehealth, but for group care. We could have we asked and said, we want to be able to have money, not just from employer sponsored health insurance, but to be able to really test out birth center birth and to really build out a public health birthing workforce and services that really could support the fact that most births are normal physiologic births. In our statistics earlier, we were remiss not to say that yes, there is a horrible disparity when we think about the differences between people who die from complications from pregnancy and childbirth. But we should also state that that is generally estimated to be between 800 and 900 people per year when we have between you know, 3.8 and 4 million births in the United States every year. So it's important to say that yes, that disparity is great, but the actual overall number is actually low and rare, but we still need to pay attention to it because 60% of those deaths are considered to be preventable. Well, and let me jump in here too with the mental health piece, because when that risk assessment says you have one person, what it's saying is your physical health matters, but your mental health doesn't, right? Because your mental and your emotional health, you can deal with those later. And what we know is that perinatal PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a traumatic experience that leads to ongoing symptoms of depression, anxiety, et cetera, that is triggered by childbirth itself. And typically by pain that's uncontrolled, by feeling out of control, by being not listened to by your medical providers and by feeling unsupported. The data does not link PTSD to whether or not you had a C-section or a forceps delivery. It links it to all the other factors that go yeah. along with having more than one person if that's what you want, right? We also know, you just talked, Monica, about the lower numbers of actual deaths. Perinatal PTSD is a major risk factor for postpartum depression, which mm -hmm. is about 15% of women overall and upwards of 40% of African American women in this country. And suicide is the number two cause of death for women in the year after they deliver a baby. Yeah. After cardio cardiac event. Yeah. The number two cause of death. So when we say mental health doesn't matter, you can just have your physical health and not get COVID, we are absolutely missing the forest for the trees in right. terms of what matters. And there are huge racial disparities in there as well. And we talk well, about, you know, mortality and now we're talking about mental health, but there's also the morbidity and, you know, these injuries, absolutely. injuries absolutely. and childbirth that right. people carry for, for the rest of their lives. The I want to, I want to take um, an, a question um, that we got from the audience. Um, and this, this kind of reminds me of just kind of looking at, history. We've talked a little bit about, you know, the structures of hospital systems and birthing. And, um, you know, I recently did a, a story about the, the father of, of modern gynecology who, you know, did these experiments on enslaved Black women. Um, but there's also this history of, you know, kind of the destruction of the midwifery system in the United States. And so I'll kind of, I'll pair that with this question from the audience that there's some news around an increase in, in home births or a push for more birthing centers. Um, you know, thoughts on that. Um, Dr. Kruger? I, I think I try to, because as an OBGYN, I think it's really important for me to really talk about this. Um, our, our field is, uh, was built and founded, our founding on the backs of three black women who were enslaved, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka, and our founding, when we use a retractor in the operating room, it's called a Sims retractor, and he created that retractor by operating on black women who were enslaved without any anesthesia over and over and over again. He would travel around the country um, doing this, and he did it, and he then wrote textbooks where he would say the reason that he could do this on them is because black women did not feel pain. 
And if you ask medical students today, and I also have to mention the reason we keep only having to ask medical students is because a lot of times when people are doing studies and they try to ask older providers, physicians, we say no. So a lot of the data is what medical students said. But so the medical students who are taught by older physicians said, believe that black people still don't have feel pain and that they, their skin is a thicker skin. And these are still things in 2018 that people still believe. So this history of devaluing of um, black bodies is real. And the original midwif midwives were granny midwives were black women. And they birthed everybody, black people, white people, everybody. The, the birthing of America was done by granny midwifery. And that was decimated um, in the turn of the century and created this new um, hyper-medicalized way to provide care. And at some mm -hmm. point, all the other countries didn't do what we did. So that's why when we say racism is at the root cause, we have to be honest about that. Um, we didn't decimate midwifery in the UK. We didn't decimate midwifery in, um, in, in um, Nor Norway and Denmark. All the places that have better birthing outcomes than we do, they have a lot of midwives. But when you devalue black people, and that's the people who are doing the midwifery, you end up hurting your own selves. We have this when it over and over and over again. History has taught us that when we do these things like devaluing black people in the US and around the globe, it only causes us to have further harm as a world. So that's why and we don't have it in the US. Well, and the truth of the matter is our midwifery, again, going back to investments in public health and clinical health services provision, you know, our, we've not made important investments in midwifery. And I sit as a tenured professor at a public university in one of the 39 schools of nursing that have nurse midwifery programs. So let me, let's talk about midwives because we have multiple different kinds. We have licensed midwives, we have certified professional midwives, we have uh, certified nurse midwives. And reminder, only 2% of midwives in the United States are estimated to be black, 2%. Of the 108 HPUs, historically black colleges and universities in the United States, of the 39 that have medical schools, public health, and schools of nursing, zero have programs in midwifery. When we already know that historically black colleges and universities are the number one generators of STEM graduates in the United States. So the one place where we could actually have, you know, a whole cadre of individuals, we actually don't have educational preparation. That's a policy decision that we could make differently, right? So we could decide to, when everybody was up in arms around the COVID-19 and why did historically black colleges and universities get money? Um, hello, if we really want to be able to expand the midwifery workforce, then you have to be able to have educational and clinical training opportunities for them to do so. But here in California, we got a whole interesting situation where we just had a bill that comes out of our legislature to allow midwives to work the magic that they actually do and to remove physician supervision. This has been a turf battle in order to be able to unleash the creativity of midwifery. Again, going back to Joya's essential history. When we decided that, that birth was a clinical condition to be managed in high risk medical environments, that there was only a set or a harbinger of the, the healthcare workforce that could actually be qualified or competent to take care of people with the capacity for pregnancy. Then, then we have what we have now. I wanted to, you know, since we do have storytellers in our audience, just kind of walk people through, like when we talk about maternal death, like what are we talking about? You know, what is, what is happening a lot of times? And one of the things that I found in my reporting on this is that, so many of the stories are heartbreakingly similar. Like mm -hmm. you hear so many of the same details. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, Dr. Kier Perry, I wonder if you can just kind of walk us through, you know, I'm thinking of, of names like Kira Johnson or Amber Rose Isaac, who, you know, I, I just talked to her partner for a story. Like what is often happening when, when these moms die? I think that's why it's so important that we keep harping on having social connectedness. Because when we listen to the people who have what we call near misses or people who almost die, they also have a very similar story. Um, so they had someone there or they themselves really had to advocate to survive themselves. Like it wasn't like some medical person came in and saved the day. That's always a very similar thing that they had to keep saying over and over and over again. Like Serena Williams, no for real, listen to me, right? So the ones who don't survive, like Kira Johnson or like Amber Rose Isaac, you hear they were advocating, advocating for themselves and no one ever listened. And by the time- Or they were sent away. 
Yeah, and by the time someone did listen, it was too late. And so that's why um, when we only harp on pre-existing illnesses, you'll hear people start with, the reason why the Black Women's Matter Alliance was so important to start is because we knew when the language came out or when the data showed that we were three to four times more likely to die in childbirth, that they would do just like you see now in the media, the difference between how people frame Black people dying more um, from COVID, right? So we knew when they heard that data, they were going to say, of course, Black women die three to four times more likely. They have, they're more obese, they're too fat, they don't listen, they're non-compliant, they don't go to the doctor. Um, that assumption that Black people innately are all too fat and all don't listen also assumes that all white folks are skinny and, and follow all instruction. And I don't know about y'all, but I've, I know a lot of white women and they definitely don't follow a lot of instruction. So this idea that compliance, fit all, <laughs> non-compliance is a Black thing is, is, a, is a racist idea. Um, so anyway, when a person um, is having a baby, most deaths happen not at the time of birth. That was another bias that we had. So the assumptions when we started actually working on maternal mortality as a nation, um, we started only focusing on the time of death, at the time of birth, at the time of childbirth. We assumed it was a, a traumatic event that happened when you're delivering a baby. And when we actually looked at the data, when we pulled it apart, people are dying up to a year later. You know, you think about Erica Garner. Erica Garner died six months after her child was born. She was only 28 years old. She had her heart enlarged and she died. I mean, think about it. she was reenacting her father's death, lying on concrete in New York City, fighting the mayor, fighting the police department, pregnant and then birthing. Of course her heart would break, right? But we still would like to biologicalize that. So yeah, I, some of the questions around epigenetics, for me, that's the same thing is smoking causes lung changes. They, I'm sure it causes some epigenetic changes, but we're not telling people we need to fix their epigenetic changes. We're saying, let's work on ending the tobacco industry's ability to just give anybody tobacco. That's the upstream effect. We don't just need to fix the individual behaviors of the individuals, but really looking at the harm that's being caused by racism. So her body, we're dying three months later, six months later. We're not being listened to because people don't value us and don't believe what we say. Thinking about, um, th thank you so much for, for walking us through that. Uh, another question from the audience, um, thinking about the, you know, the structural, this institutional relation, racism that we've, we've talked about, um, in terms of solutions, are there models that are, you know, up and running in the U.S. Um, to look at accountability, you know, within hospitals or um, other medical institutions? You know, how can you hold providers accountable or systems accountable? So, you know, there's a couple of different, you know, projects that are going on. I, I will be very blunt and say that there is no systematic response that I think is acceptable um, because I think they're all needed. So everything from the fact that in, you know, by 2022 in California, all clinical providers will have to have undergone some implicit bias training that was work that was again done on LA and Black Women for Wellness, you know, legislatively passed to really, really try to start to get at, you know, sort of the existing workforce and making sure the future workforce has some understanding of the concepts in terms of how racism contributes to, you know, these poor outcomes. You've seen some people try to lay this at the feet of doulas and I've really tried to push back from that. They should not exclusively be responsible for solving a problem that they don't create. That's, That's big, it. Big responsibility. They, yeah. they are essential members of the, the workforce and we need to welcome them as such. And we need simulations with them, particularly around disrupting uh, racist language or, or racist activities or mistreatment. What the data we've seen from our study where people are not being listened to or signs and symptoms of deterioration are not being recognized. Um, so there's different ways that people are trying to get at this. Of course, I think diversification of the healthcare workforce has got to be on the table around that. We need more team-based care. We need more access to midwives um, and doulas and in teams and nurses and physicians and mental health workers. I mean, going back to Dr. Dosich, I'm sure she'll talk about this, but you know, 40% of maternal deaths are estimated to happen in the postpartum period. So maybe we need to be paying closer attention to the people who are in postpartum period. Pay family leave could probably be a game changer here. So as we keep talking about different things, you know, let's not limit ourselves to healthcare. 
Because again, if we really think racism is the problem, that opens up other types of conversations we could have around what are the policy levers and terms of solution. Right, you know, social, right? social determinants. You know, social determinants of health is this wonky term mm -hmm. in public policy, but it, it has to do with all, all of this. Everything that we're talking about that's beyond the healthcare you know, what happens in the clinic, what happens in that hospital room. Dr. Perry, you say something? Yeah, I, I was just gonna say that um, this COVID, so how that relates also during COVID-19, um, we don't have the, the infrastructure for uh, the data collection. And so the same um, lack of information that we didn't have for birthing people before, we really, it's really escalated now um, during this time. And so I just worry that, um, when if we don't have if we don't start um linking kind of the data part um to i'm sorry i when you started talking i lost my train of thought that was very <laughs> so i will it'll come back to me i'm getting old i apologize <laughs> dr dossett did you want to add anything to that well yeah i was going to just tag on about the social determinants of health and yeah it's kind of a wonky term but it's something that's incredibly logical which is basically your body doesn't exist in a vacuum right? Like everything that goes on in your life affects your health. And it's something that medicine just now seems to be cluing into. But at the same time, in a weird way, it's like medicine has been tasked with like fixing it. And I think that that doesn't make a lot of sense either. And it's really, the data is really striking in countries that have strong social support networks, right? They have really good universal public education for everybody. They have single payer healthcare systems. They have the right to housing, right? They have, um, you know, more than six weeks of paid family leave if you're lucky, which is just the most ridiculous thing ever. If they have all of those social structures in place, then medicine people can be medicine people and their medicine outcomes are better. Right. Than ours. Because yeah. once the person leaves the clinic, they're not walking into a world that feels scary and traumatizing to them, right? Mm -hmm. They're ideally walking into a world that is gonna actually like provide a little bit of stability. We do not have that in this country. And the other reason why we don't, and I'm not advocating here for single payer system, I know that's not the topic, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> but, because we don't have one, it is impossible to link our public health objectives with our clinical objectives. Mm -hmm. Because our clinical objectives are split all over the place. If you're a private insurance company, it's to make money. If you're an academic medical center, it's to stay afloat and maybe train some people along the way. If it's a safety net you know, community-based provider, it's to try to get enough grants to keep your doors open. And you can't do all that and still have uniform implementation of public policy. So this country, the public health conversation is huge, but I don't know how we're gonna have it when we have a medical system that's as fragmented as it currently is. Yeah, something I used to say a lot <laughs> when I was reporting on early childhood is just like, it's all connected, it's all connected. Right. And I think we're seeing that, you know, the pandemic is showing us how we're connected as a world, how oh, yeah. you know, health and economy are all all tied into one. Um, one I question that I want to make. That's good. I'm sorry. Huh? I oh, remember. You remember? Yeah, that was just, it was about accountability. That's why it was kind of important. Because right. <laughs> the person asked about accountability, and yeah. I just wanted to be really clear. Um, I, especially during COVID, accountability in COVID. So I do anti-racism implicit bias trainings. We work with large hospital systems. We did one in Kaiser at Atlanta. Um, we work with health departments, with small centers. Really, um, the beginning of the conversation of decolonizing our beliefs around our bodies, around our health, and really unpacking where these biases come from. So that's really important. I um, mean, I think about this moment we're in with COVID because we've been doing the same work in police departments. Yes, I'm going there. So we've been doing the same work in police departments for years. Some of my same colleagues who do work on implicit bias also do work with the police departments. So if you don't have accountability along with trainings, you get the same outcomes. So we don't change the power. I'm not here to just do trainings and you get to keep your same power jobs and treat me crazy. There has to be accountability when you don't modify your behaviors, if we don't shift the power inside of healthcare, if we don't shift the power inside of police departments, the point of the training is not in place of allowing for growth and for black folks to thrive. The point of the training is in place of the fact that we, we are taught 
um, incorrect things in school. Like if I was taught that race is biological in my medical school, who's ever gonna teach me anything different? I'm not going back to medical school. So someone has to train the people who are currently practicing that the things that they were taught were inaccurate. So we need that. In addition to accountability for people who when they are harmful, for people when they are treated poorly in systems and structures that don't um, create room for people to thrive. That was it. Great, I'm glad, glad you remembered that. Um, something that I wanna make sure uh, to get out there since you know, we do have this audience of screenwriters, you know, storytellers, are there things that you have seen in movies or you know, on, on TV shows that people are getting wrong? Like, you know, I know Kate calls it the please stop. Like, what are you seeing out there? Myths that need to be busted, plot lines that need to be reframed. Um, if, 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 any, if any of you have, have an example. Dr. Dossett, do you have something? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so enough with the hilarious scene where the woman's giving birth and is screaming curse words and hates her husband, et cetera. Just, no, just stop that, okay? Just enough. Um, I think too, it is, we call it in maternal mental health world, um, the myth of motherhood, where as soon as you have a baby, the heavens open and the angels sing and the baby comes down and your life is transformed and you're never the same again. Now that is all true, that your life is transformed and you're never the same again. I'm a mother of two who are becoming teenagers. They're eating downstairs as we speak, I am sure. But um, there needs to be acknowledgement of the fact that so many women are ambivalent about their pregnancies. So many women have pregnancies that maybe they did not choose, that were maybe forced upon them physically or otherwise. And that there are a lot of women who once they have that baby, it's not necessarily um, all sunshine and roses. There is a lot of difficulty that goes with having a baby, even if you have no external circumstances, you're a white woman in suburbia, but if you're someone who's dealing with the institutional racism that goes along with this, if you're someone who's marginalized for other reasons, it can be a really challenging time. Yeah. So I just, there needs to be space yeah. there for conversation that's different from the storyline that motherhood is the end all be all. Yeah, and Dr. Dawson, I want to stay with you for a second to, to add in a question from the audience. You know, are there myths partic particularly around postpartum depression um, in the black community, like what, what do you think needs to be corrected there? Um, I am not a black woman. I cannot speak to that experience. Um, I have seen in my own work that understandably there is often, um, it's hard sometimes for a woman to really decide that enough trust is there to come in and want to actually, particularly if she's struggling with some pretty serious mental illness and needs medication, to, to stay with that in pregnancy in order to keep herself healthy in the postpartum. And that makes a lot of sense for a lot of historical reasons. The other thing I see a lot um, in the Black community, primarily, I think, because a lot of the patients I work with are very, very low income, is so many of their children become involved in um, child protective services. And it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And it becomes a trauma for everybody involved. So um, that is something that is also a major disparity. In and our that speaks to you know, the inter interconnectivity of everything. Yeah. Um, Monica, you know, please stop. What, what, what are you tired of seeing? My please stop is real simple, okay? And I have two of them. Uh, number one, because I'm on team childless by a choice, 24% of the world's population are not parents. So how about we stop acting like parenthood is a universal experience? Um, that's universally experienced. Um, and then the second one, some of the early work that we're seeing with COVID-19 um, and in, in work that we're seeing specific to um, tear gas being an abortifacient, not all pregnancies end in birth. 
And so how about we tell some of those stories as well, because there should be a human rights campaign to stop having tear gas at any particular situation or circumstance where people with the capacity for pregnancy might be, because we are really, really seeing the intersection between COVID-19 and miscarriage and potential tear gas, you know, as an abortifacient. And so all, all pregnancies don't end in birth. And so I would love to see some of that complexity brought in. And that also could help to also capture some of our, you know, families who are, are struggling with infertility. We need a, a broader narrative, and this is where reproductive justice is helpful, to really be able to talk about the reproductive life course of, of, of people. Okay, Dr. Career Perry, quickly, and then I have one more question for all of you. Okay, cool. Yeah, just quickly, same, I echo those things. And um, if we could see Black women, we talked about this earlier, that despite income or education, we're still more likely to die in childbirth. So please stop only showing us as poor or um, that we don't, uh, uh, our children are, um, you know, neglected. We have, because even when we do the right things, as you call them, or if we work really hard, we're still, racism still harms us. So you're not helping us when you spread a narrative that we should just act right. Because um, us mm -hmm. acting right doesn't save us. Um, so I love patients no matter what they show up with. And, and, and we are all human and at the full breath. I don't think you should need to have a perfect um, victim, you know, Rosa Parks, all that stuff. But at the same time, you don't only show black women um, not being broken uh, and because you then create a myth for people that they, uh, that, that they don't realize that even when they do the right things or when we have these supposed um, uh, high achieving jobs, we're still more likely to die than, than white women who don't have a high school education. So don't continue to perpetuate that for us, please. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really important because I know that I remember interviewing a researcher once who was like, you know, I know journalists are always looking for that story that people will remember that they can frame the narrative around. But she's like, you know, I want to be clear that this is not just one person's story. You know, the issue is that they're part of this larger trend. So kind of finding that balance between the individual story and, you know, tying that into the complexity of the statistics. Okay, so um, one last question from the audience here, and it's a good note to end on. Are there things in, in your world um, around reprodu reproductive health and reproductive justice that you're excited for? And especially, I think, through the context of, of, of this pandemic, you know, what lessons do you hope that people learn from this? You know, what, what, what are you excited about? Uh, Monica, you wanna start? Oh yeah, cause I could get, I could go on a long list, but I'm gonna I'm make this short. Okay, we have five First minutes. First of all, um, eight weeks ago, people didn't think that this could have been different, and now all of a sudden, we've seen all sorts of stuff be different. Working across state lines, CMS reimbursement for telehealth. You know, I mean, we we can we recapture some of that spirit of wow, this actually really could be different, and it doesn't take a decade to work on a bill to make this happen. Mm -hmm. I'm still excited that Omnibus has not lost its steam, and it is still a bill introduced by the Black Maternal Caucus, Rep. Alma Adams and Rep. Lauren Underwood, who's a nurse who happens to be a personal shero. Um, though that's still a bill that we could still make, we could still have that future right? Visionary, bold. Many of the things that we uh, put into place under COVID-19 could actually be permanent and, and funded um, because it's so many of those, those interventions were, were in the moment of this. So I'm excited. Now, at least people know it could be done differently. And I don't just have to say that. Yeah, we're seeing that things can be done differently. Um, yeah. Dr. Dossett? Yeah, I, I feel very similarly, actually. I mean, DMH, which has been talking about, Department of Mental Health, where I work, um, has been talking about telemental health for 20 years. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We did it like on Tuesday because we had to, you know? Yep. And now all of a sudden, I haven't been in the office since March and I've seen, seen evaluated, talked to more of my patients than in the previous six months because I can reach them. They'll pick up the phone and talk to me. They don't want to take three buses across town, but they'll talk to me. And so we all of a sudden, it's now it's kind of like baked into our infrastructure. So that's exciting. And the other thing that we finally saw happen was all our little siloed agencies, right? Like our health service and our public health and our mental health and our housing mm -hmm. agency and our, you know, that, you know, no one should ever talk to each other. And we're all having our own individual funding streams. That all fell by the wayside in order to get people off of the streets and into housing, to get domestic violence victims 
and survivors into home, into hotel rooms. And it was like, this is not that hard guys. You just have to decide to do it. So I think that's, what's been exciting to me. The file of silo is keeping it up, right? <laughs> right. You feel the inertia of the bureaucracy coming yeah. back, right? Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's why, you know, everyone's calling it social distancing. distancing. I'm like, it's physical distancing. Physical because, distancing. You know, we're that's making right. more connections in so many, so many ways. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You ready? Uh, uh, so health yeah. is a right. Health is a right. So uh, we, uh, Dr. Dawson talked about it earlier, and I think um, even in the conversation we've been talking about this, when I talk about the U.S. being the only wealthy nation that hasn't agreed that health is a right, there are 37 other nations. And even if you don't agree on single payer, we don't even care about how you get there. Could we have a national conversation that everybody should be healthy? So that would make us do things like paid leave. That would make us do things like acts that no one should be unhoused. Like believing, because our current belief as a country, our current framework, our current narrative, the current story we tell ourselves is this survival of the fittest. That's been our narrative for 400 years. So we just now realize that fit always meant old rich white men. We didn't know that that's what fit meant, right? So now we're realizing that if you weren't any of those things, if you didn't have those identities, you were be able, you're expendable. And that's what COVID-19 is showing all the people. And now even old rich white dudes are expendable, right? Because COVID-19, we can... People who are elderly, they don't have to be here anymore according to some of the narrative that we have in our survival of the fittest mm -hmm. language. So if we believe the least of these are as important, if we believe as a country, if we move our value set to believing that health is a right, we would change so many of our infrastructures around human rights, around the belief of having access to mental health that's not separate from physical health, of having access to abortion. All of those things are really critical. Infertility, treatments, other countries who have wealth, they provide infertility, three rounds of in vitro fertilization on public insurance. That's when you believe health is a right. You don't think you can look at a person and decide if they're health based upon their skin color. You believe all people should have all the things that they need. Well, thank you all so much for that insight and for your work that you do. Um, I'm sorry that we could not get to all the questions. Uh, there were a lot, but this was a wonderful discussion. Um, in a moment here, you're gonna see a survey that will pop up um, and we'd love to get feedback from the audience on this panel. Um, but I think we are, are all done here. Kate, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Thanks so much for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Priska, and thanks to our panel. This was a fantastic discussion, and yeah, I, I apologize we couldn't get to all the questions. We have a lively group that have tons of questions they wanted to ask, but thank you all for attending. This event is recorded and will uh, be posted on our website in a day or two, so you can share it with your friends who were unable to watch. Uh, also, feel free to visit our website, hollywoodhealthandsociety.org, where you can, uh, we can connect you with these, this panel, with these experts, if you want to talk to them in more detail about your scripts and projects. Um, sorry, guys, I just volunteered you for, for <laughs> working with, with our writers. I'm excited. Come in. <laughs> But uh, you can reach out to us there. And again, thank you to all of our panelists and to Priska Neely, who did a magnificent job moderating. And I wish you all a very good evening and good night.